lot of unexpected murder on this podcast. book isn't necessarily better a library podcast presented by the community library network my name is roxanne and i am your host today along with michaela your co-host today we are talking about a classic peter pan peter pan jm barry now the purpose of this podcast of course is to talk about books and the adaptations that have been made from them so we're going to stop start off with michaela giving a synopsis of this book or play or what else hasn't it been made into It's been made into a lot of things, and actually one of my favorite adaptations of all time comes from this because it started out as a play. It was then created into a book. A biography was written of J.M. Barrie's life story. That biography was turned into a movie, and then that movie was turned into a play. So the cycle of adaptation in Peter Pan is nuts. I think I followed that, but let's break it down a little bit. Why don't we start by talking about J.M. Barry's biography? Sure. J.M. Barry, that's James Matthew Barry, was born in 1860 in Scotland and lived most of his life in England. He obviously wrote Peter Pan. There are several books in that Peter Pan series. He also was a playwright before he wrote these books and not a very successful playwright to begin with. He wrote some critically declaimed works, let's say. <laughs> But despite his not being that great of a of playwright to begin with, he was friends with a great number of literary greats. His friends included Robert Louis Stevenson, George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, Thomas Hardy. He was also like friends with famous explorers and the royals Elizabeth II and Princess Margaret. So this guy like got around. He knew how to network. He really Clearly. did. Clearly. Clearly. He also somehow passed off one of his plays he was writing to Arthur Conan Doyle. He was like, here, finish this for me. Artie, and and apparently he did. So not really sure how he got to be friends with all of these crazy famous people, but he uh, had an interesting life for sure. And after Peter Pan came out, he started having more success in the theater. He was involved in the 1909 and 1911 attempts to challenge the censorship of the theater by the Lord Chamberlain. We love that as librarians. We we read banned books. We do. And banned plays. And banned plays. Yes. Uh, Later on in his life, he was made a baronet by King George V. He was made a member of the Order of Merit in 1922. So pretty interesting guy. And some of the most interesting time of his life was when he met the Llewellyn Davies family. These boys are the basis of Peter Pan. So Llewellyn Davies, is Llewellyn the name of the father? No. Um, It's actually, they have kind of a compound last name. Oh, that's pretty common in yeah. England. Yeah, so they were known as the Llewellyn Davies family. Gotcha. It's all of their last name. The dad's name is Arthur. The mom's name is Sylvia. She's the daughter of George de Marier. Her brother was also a famous actor. Her niece is Daphne de Marier. Oh, who, who okay. Wrote Rebecca. Right. So I thought that sounded familiar. <clears throat> yeah, that whole family is is very, very famous. So uh, J.M. Barry met the boys. Actually, he used to spend a lot of time in Kensington Park. So he met some of the Llewellyn Davies boys. Uh, There are five of them all together, George, John, Peter, Michael, and Nicholas. Those names sound familiar. They really do. You're going to hear them a lot today. I also uh, found out that Kensington Gardens is now uh, referred to as Hyde Park. Oh, I did not know that. Mm -hmm. Okay, learned something new today. So he met the boys in the park. They they all went there a lot. Jay and Barry went there to write. The boys obviously went to the park because they're boys. They're going to the park. And later on, he met their mom at a dinner, just coincidentally, and found out that she was related to them and started spending a lot of time with the family. The legend goes that they started writing, he started writing Peter Pan based on the adventures that they had. He used to tell the older boys that their brother Peter was going to fly away when he was a little boy. That's weird. Yeah, right? Um, Just to kind of amuse them. Okay. Apparently, that's what kids were amused by in the early 1900s. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. And then created the character of Peter Pan who first appears in the novel The Little White Bird. And then in 1904, there was a stage version called Peter Pan or The Boy Who Wouldn't Grow Up. And then later it got called Peter and Wendy, and later it just got called Peter Pan. And that's where we get Peter Pan. Eventually, he wrote a novel adaptation of his own play. Right. Yeah. I was reading the novel adaptation. It is so charming. It's it's extremely cute. Yes. Yes. It is. 
Uh, and it got novelized in 1911, so about seven years after that play came out. Very cool. So um seems like he had kind of an interesting relationship with the Davies kids. Yeah. So there, there's been some speculation later that it might have been an inappropriate relationship. At the time, nobody was making those claims, and he was basically an uncle figure to them. So they called him Uncle Jim. The Llewellyn Davies family like came out to his cottage in the summers and spent time playing outside. He entertained them with stories. Later on, when their, their dad had died, their mom also died, and in her will, she had asked for him to keep supporting them financially. And he kind of did some hocus pocus on the will that he presented to her family and also kind of made him a guardian. I saw that too. I was watching a documentary where yeah. she had designated guardianship to somebody named Jenny. Yeah, Mrs. Hodges and her sister. It was the caretaker and the yeah. caretaker's sister. And he changed Jenny to Jimmy. Yep. Like somebody changing like a C <laughs> to a B on a report card. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So he kind of took over joint guardianship of them, along with there were other guardians too, their grandmother and, like I said, their maid and some other people. But yeah, he kind of insinuated himself into that, which he was always going to like financially support them. Just he kind of gave himself a little bit of extra like say so over their lives. Hmm. Yeah. He was also, I mean, very good friends with them for basically all of their lives. Two of them did die very young, I believe George and Michael. And then the other three boys were basically friends with him throughout the rest of their lives. And they were always very appreciative of him and very happy that he was in their lives. Did you know that the child Peter grew up to be a publisher of Mary Poppins? I really didn't. That's really cool. And we'll talk about Mary Poppins later. So how did um, Jan Berry's life end. Did he die young? Did he live to old age? I mean, he was like 67 when he died, and I don't fully know how he died. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, he's kind of just a a normal guy. Did he ever get married? He was married for a time to an actress. Her name was Mary, and uh, later they divorced in 1909, and he financially supported her for the rest of her life as well. Wow, okay. Kind of an interesting guy. He also, when he died, he bequeathed the rights to all of the Peter Pan works to the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. Oh. And they still make money off of that. So I learned that, um, just some fun facts, I learned that um, he didn't invent the term Never Never Land. Do you know where that came from? No. It's actually an Australian term for the outback. Okay. That's what they call it. Or they did call it. Never Never Land. (laughs) It's my terrible Aussie (laughs) accent. Better than I could do. (laughs) And are you aware that the name Wendy comes from Peter Pan? I saw that when we were researching this. That's really fascinating. Yeah, so I dug into that a little bit. And so he didn't necessarily invent the name Wendy, but he did popularize it. But there is a fun apocryphal story that the name Wendy comes from another child friend he had named Margaret Henley, who would say, you are my Fwendy Wendy, which is incredibly charming. I only heard about the Fwendy part. I didn't hear Fwendy Wendy. Yeah, Fwendy Wendy. (laughs) That's really cute. So let's jump in. I'll give you a little bit of a, I mean, hopefully you've seen some adaptation of Peter Pan. You're probably familiar. So we'll go through this pretty quickly. The Darling family, which is Wendy, John, and Michael Darling, follow Peter, who's a boy who never grows up into the magical realm of Never Never Land. And they live in London, right? Yes. What time period does it take place in? Late 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah, I think it's pretty contemporary for when he was writing. Mm -hmm. In Neverland, they discover mermaids and pirates and lost boys, and they fight this great pirate battle before they finally return to their own parents in London, and then Wendy grows up, tragically. So that's the whole story of Peter Pan. I seem to remember as well some uh, problematic... Yeah. Uh, people they encounter? There there are. So here's the problematic part of writing in the 1900s. They encounter what they call redskins in Neverland. And redskins is what we would today call American Indians, right? They all have pretty stereotypical American Indian names that don't necessarily reflect any sort of tribe whatsoever and uh, act in pretty stereotypical ways. And they call Peter the Great White Father. Yikes. Yeah, so there's some there's some iffy stuff in here as well. You have to remember that it was written in a, in a culturally insensitive time period. Absolutely. Yeah. I think what bothers me about it the most is that it's like they go to this land 
land where there's all these mythical creatures. Yes. And people who actually exist and are real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in a very like caricatured way. Like pirates Mm -hmm. also exist. They were real, but they feel like real people. Whereas the Native Americans in this do not feel like real people. Right. And they weren't taken, again, specifically from any tribe. Um, but the, the main character in the Native American tribe is uh, Tiger Lily, right? Mm-hmm. It's been interesting to see how they depict her in different adaptations as mm-hmm. as we get a little bit more sensitive yep. <laughs> throughout the century. A little bit more sensitive and a little bit more cognizant of feminist issues. So she doesn't have a lot of agency in, say, the Disney movie. She plays a damsel in distress, right? Yeah. Basically. But um, other versions do have her with, with a lot more of her own agency. Does she play a love interest to Peter Pan? or It's weird because in most of the versions he's supposed to be a kid. He's like 12 years old. Right. In some of the versions he's played off like he's maybe in his late teens. And in those versions he is more like girl crazy. I think he also kisses some mermaids. Right. And then they also like to pit Wendy and Tiger Lily against each other. Oh, yeah. And that, no, it doesn't really happen in the book. Tinkerbell and Wendy have a little bit of a a tiff. Mm -hmm. Not really Wendy so much, but Tinkerbell is jealous of Wendy. Right. But yeah, I don't think they're really pitted against each other as like romantic rivals for Peter. In the book. In the book. No, but I believe in the Disney movie, Tiger Lily is jealous of Wendy. Yes. I think everyone's jealous of Wendy. Well, and I think there's a scene they're having a, a party and Wendy is kind of on the outskirts of the party and can't get the boys to go to bed. And Peter's acting as the great white father. Yikes. Uh, yikes. And Tiger Lily does kiss him. That does happen. You're right. In the Disney movie. And Wendy walks away from the party. So also a little bit of jealousy there. Okay. Yeah. No, you're totally right. That does happen. Which, again, is weird because they're all children. Yes. Yes. And the premise or the conceit of it is that Peter Pan ran away in his baby carriage Mm -hmm. to Never Never Land because he was listening to his mom talk about how he was going to grow up and do great things and go to school and be a businessman. Mm -hmm. And then he just sort of moves his own perambulator. (laughs) In, and then runs away. And it depends on what version you're exactly. reading. Um, in, the Ken- in Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens, which is one of the Peter Pan books, supposedly all children start out as birds. And then when they go, when they're parents... Oh my god, the, is this yeah. going to be a siren fight again? It's not going to be a siren fight. It's nothing like the siren <laughs> fight. All children start as birds. And then when they're given to their parents, they start transforming into children. And Peter, before he totally had transformed into a child, flew away. Oh, oh, that it, explains a lot. Yes, but in the normal Peter Pan version, which it's weird because they don't, like they're part of the same set, but they're not really, they don't go together. Because in the normal Peter Pan, he does just like push himself out of his perambulator. Right. Somehow at like seven days old and lifts up his own head and just gets right on out of <laughs> he there. Has, <laughs> he, has, he has neck control. Yeah. <laughs> Got some insane muscle control nice, for, a, good for, him. for a week old kid. But it's also interesting to talk about all of the connections to not growing up or maybe dead children. Ooh. Okay, so this is a really... This just got dark. It did, and it's it's not really dark, but it's kind of an interesting thing. So J.M. Barry's own brother died when he was young, and he used to dress in his brother's clothes and kind of like put on his mannerisms and stuff because his brother was his mom's favorite child. Mm-hmm. She fell into his really dark depression, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so he kind of played off like he was his brother. So that's where some of this comes from. And then Peter obviously is not quite human because he never grows up. Mrs. Darling, the Darling children's mom, says, oh yeah, I think I remember a story about Peter Pan from when I was young. He's Mm. the kid who guides all the other kids on their way if they've died. He guides the other kids halfway to heaven. Just halfway? Uh, Yeah, he doesn't take them. who, Who is he dropping them off to? I'm not really sure. It's not really explained. But that's, is there a system here? No. There's just he just pushes you out into the ether. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so he takes you part of the way to the afterlife. In that Kensington Gardens one, he does bury a couple of children who die young. So making graves for little kids. And this is one I'd really love to unpack or for someone else to unpack for me. In Peter Pan. There's a part where he says there's only like five or six lost boys at any given time when they grow up or when they start to grow up, Peter thins them out. Yes. I saw that too. So, uh, (laughs) does he murder? I don't know. I don't know if he, he just nicely escorts them back to earth. Nicely well, I mean, escorts he them to escort into the to ether. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. I, to me, that reads Mm. like, he's like, "Eh, you're dead because you were going to grow up and leave me. 
I, in some of the versions, wait, was be- he going to? Gra- were they going to grab, or was he? Yeah. Or is it that he's just getting new uh, shipments of Lost Boys? And no, so- I, I think he gets new shipments because he's thinned out the old shipments. It, it literally says when they're about to grow up, Peter thins them out. Oh, so the Lost Boys don't stay. Long. They don't stay forever. And again, it depends on what version you're into. Okay, the book so this version, definitely is a, a canon thing. Yeah, it's a canon thing. In some of the versions, the boys grow up and become the pirates. Mm. So, yeah. I like that. I, I like that, That's too. That's fun. I think it's fun. But anyway, if you can tell us if Peter Pan is a murderer or not, <laughs> we really need to know. There's also a part later where ju- they're all talking about how they fit down their little tree holes to get right. into their underground bunker. <laughs> their bunker? <laughs> their bunker. <laughs> it's, a, it's a house type thing. Anyway, they all have their own individual trees. To, like, go in and out like of... Like Keebler elves, Yeah, basically. Okay. <laughs> to get in and out of this uh, bunker. And he says that if the trees don't fit the kids, he makes the kids fit the trees. Ah! <laughs> what? So, again, I think, like, he has to make John fit into his tree. So, I literally think he just takes a knife and kind of, like, shaves him down until he fits. It's like in um the scary version of Cinderella where the <gasps> stepsisters yeah. tried to make the shoe fit. So... One sister cut off her toes mm-hmm. and one sister cut off her heel. Yeah. And then it filled up with blood. Yep. Pretty gross. Yeah. Gross. Blood in a glass slipper. Not a great image. No. Mm-hmm. I, I do love children's stories from back in the day because they're always horrifying. So let's talk about some adaptations. What do you want to talk about first? Sure. Well, uh... First, let's just talk about the play. So I know oh, yeah. that that actually came first, but I have some really happy childhood memories of seeing adaptations of the play because it's so oh, magical when you're a kid. Did you ever see I it? I haven't ever seen a play version. It's it's really magical. I saw it at the Children's Theater in <clears throat> Minneapolis. So. <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> but it is, it is a really magical experience because uh, at one point they break the fourth wall. So you might be familiar with the scene where they say, You know, or Tinkerbell has maybe died. It looks like they died. And you have to bring her back to life. And so they turn the lights up and they say, do you believe in fairies? And they break the fourth wall and they ask the audience. And everyone in the audience is crying and clapping. And they bring Tinkerbell back to life. And when you're a kid, it's just amazing. And when you're an adult, it's it's still amazing. I'm like tearing up just thinking about it. I think that's really great. It's a really special experience. And then, of course, seeing them fly on stage is mm-hmm. incredibly exciting oh, how cool mm-hmm. okay so if you can make it to a play version of this absolutely do it and then uh it's so fun because one of my favorite parts of the story that i find so charming when i'm reading it is nana mm. is their dog and it's a newfoundland mm-hmm. so a big dog is their nanny which yes. is very cute and if you see the play it's somebody in a dog suit that's pretty great yes and uh, I found out that part, the new, having a Newfoundland, Newfoundland dog <laughs> is uh, because Jam Barry bought his wife a Newfoundland dog as a wedding present. Mm-hmm. What was that dog's name? I don't know. Porthos. Oh, what does that mean? Um, it's one of the Three Musketeers. That's very charming. Yeah, extremely. I think that Jam Barry was probably very charming. He seems like a really fascinating human being. He also had a Scottish accent. Well, speaking of, should we... First, talk about Finding Neverland. Sure. This is the one that I was saying there's this whole cycle of stuff behind it. So Finding Neverland is based on a biography of J.M. Barry's life. And after Finding Neverland, a musical version was also made. Of Finding Neverland. Of Finding Neverland. Oh, you know what? I was checking out some of these books at the desk yesterday, and they mm-hmm. were wearing a Finding Neverland Broadway musical shirt. Yep. The people here? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. It was cool. So, in 2004, Finding Neverland came out. It was directed by Mark Forster, based on the 1998 biography, The Man Who Was Peter Pan, by Alan Nee. It stars Johnny Depp as J.M. Barry and Kate Winslet as Sylvia Llewellyn Davies. Kate Winslet can do no wrong in my book. No. Especially when she's in a period piece. She's absolutely stunning. We, Nick and I, as we were watching this, were saying that she's basically like the classical actress of our day. Like, we don't really have that many, like, Dame Maggie Smith or like Dame Judi Denges of like this generation or this era. Mm -hmm. And she's kind of like our classical go-to actress. Yeah. And then if you need like a a real beauty queen for a period piece, it's like Keira Knightley. Yeah. Because she looks great in a costume. She looks so great in a corset. Yeah. Yeah. Good for her. Yeah. Way to go, Keira. Also, Dustin Hoffman is in this. And it's great because we'll also talk about Dustin Hoffman later. He's been in not one, but two adaptations of J.M. Barry's works. Yeah, so. absolutely. I watched Finding Neverland and then, of course, we're referring to Hook. Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty much back to back. And it was fun to see him in both. Yeah. 
because he's serious in one and he's like fun in the other one. But I actually think he plays both of them very well. He does. And then Peter in this, there's all the Llewellyn, well, actually, they cut out one of the Llewellyn Davies kids. I'm not really sure why. But the other four are all in here. And the kid who plays Peter is Freddie Highmore of the Good Doctor fame. Oh. No? Um, And because of his work in this movie, Johnny Depp recommended him to be in Willy Wonka. And the Chocolate Factory. Oh, that's what he's yeah. from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kid. He's in I knew he was in everything for a little bit there. He was in so that much. That kid can cry mm-hmm. at the end when he just has his eyes Ugh. filling up with tears, but they don't drop down his cheeks. Ugh. That is talent. Like I said, you know that I'm a bit of a robot when it comes to crying during yeah. movies, but. Did you cry during I got this a little verklempt. Oh. I got a little that's, bit verklempt. That's, that's high praise yeah. coming from Roxanne. Yeah. <laughs> It won the best score at the Academy Awards, and I do believe it has a really great score. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And I, I don't know, what what can we say about this movie, except that it's a it's a cry factory, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Johnny Depp in it is fabulous. No? Yeah, he's fantastic. Oh, okay. I love I love his accent. His accent's super good. Mm-hmm. In the movie, they do sort of touch on uh, him getting criticism that either he's having an affair with the mother Mm -hmm. or that he's having an inappropriate relationship with the kids. Sure. But I like the way that they handle it. They they basically just have him saying, like, how could you ever think something so evil? And you believe mm-hmm. him. Right. Later, one of the kids in real life was asked about it, the youngest of the kids. And he was like, I honestly don't think he ever had intentions like that toward anybody, man, woman, or child. He was like, he's the most innocent person I've ever met. And that's why he could write Peter Pan. I think you might have mentioned that mm-hmm. uh, in a previous discussion that perhaps he didn't have romantic feelings for anyone. Yes. that That's kind of my understanding from the research that I've looked into. Hmm. It's just, that's always an interesting way to look back at history. Yeah. But like we said, he was married and uh, he's married. But he never had children. In this movie, right? but never has children. Uh, he's nothing but kind towards Sylvia Llewellyn Davies. He's just a really good platonic friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's actually everyone else that seems to put their relationship in a romantic light. Sure. Everyone else pushes that tension on them, I think. And I, the movie plays it up for a little bit of effect. There is some like romantic tension between them, but it's not really overt. It's pretty subtle. Yeah. I was really looking at the scenes where they're alone together mm-hmm. and they don't discuss anything virgin romantic they actually just discuss the children yeah pretty much Mm -hmm. yeah it's mostly his wife and her mom who think anything is going on between them right i felt really bad for his wife in the movie i don't know if i feel bad for her really i i don't they seem ill-matched they seem ill-matched that's a good way to put it but i don't think she's doing anything wrong basically she's just always waiting for him to come home right and that's kind of a typical like early 20th century yeah. housewife thing. And she cares about status, but also that right. was the society she lived in. Uh, yes. And again, she was kind of famous. She was a semi-famous actor. I think her father was a famous actor or playwright. Okay. One of the two. And, and obviously these guys know a lot of high society people. So I'm sure that she was trying to keep that high society mindset and keep up appearances. And J.M. Barry is more playful and flippant and he doesn't really care if they look you know show up to the social functions and look the part he's whimsical (laughs) so i guess okay in that sense i do feel a little bit bad for her in the real sense though in their real lives uh she started having an affair with a guy who's in the movie his last name is canon okay and in real life she started up this affair it sounds like jam barry was aware of it and more or less okay with it didn't really again because he doesn't really have romantic feelings for it didn't really care Mm -hmm. but he offered to do a legal separation from her to avoid the scandal of divorce and she refused so then they got a divorce oh yeah and then he supported her for the rest of her life financially odd yeah it's a very odd he just seems he's a little bit out of societal norms right yeah interesting oh i'd love to i'd love to have a psychologist do some sort of deep dive. Right, on, on J.M. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, that's all I, I really want to say about Finding Neverland. It's a beautiful movie. It's really short. So if you have an extra, what, like hour and a half? It's pretty, pretty short. Have an extra hour and a half one day and you want to cry? Watch, <laughs> watch this movie. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the straight adaptations. Yeah. Do you want to start with the Disney Peter Pan? And sure. Then, okay, go ahead. The Disney Peter Pan came out in the 50s. They did make it into a very entertaining ride at Disneyland. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you been to Disneyland? Yeah, like 20 years ago. Yeah, you ride in a pirate ship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very charming. 
And the Disney Peter Pan, essentially it, it follows the narrative of the book and the play pretty closely. Very closely. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were the ones who made up the uh, second start of the right and full on till morning part. Oh, Did that's you know that? charming. In the book, he says the second start of the right thing, and they added the straight on till morning, oh. and that's become like part of the lore. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a great phrase. It is. I should also mention um, that in a lot of adaptations, Peter Pan's played by a woman. Yeah, in almost all of them. Mm-hmm. Up until this point, actually. This is one of the first times that they had a boy voice Peter Pan. Oh, really? Yeah, Bobby Driscoll. Bobby Driscoll. Bobby that Driscoll. sounds like such a 50s name. It's so, like, all-American... 50s absolutely yep yeah i don't have a ton to say about this movie it's It's fine it's fine uh the the song what makes the red man red is oh i forgot uh, about that hair curlingly cringy yikes it's a big yikes uh that that's more of what i remember from that movie than almost anything else and i i have not watched it in again probably 20 years so that it makes a big impression it's probably one of the ones I haven't looked, but on Disney Plus, I bet you it's one of the ones that has a warning now that says. I would imagine so. Yeah, cultural stereotypes. And beware. I think talking about Tinkerbell in this adaptation mm-hmm. definitely was the Tinkerbell that we all think of now. Mm-hmm. Because really, in the books and in the plays, you don't see Tinkerbell because she's too. St- small yeah she's really just a in the orb of light yeah in the play she's at least in the old versions i don't know how they do it now in the old versions of the play it was just a mirror and they yeah exactly they reflected the light onto the screen onto whatever part of the stage Mm -hmm. and rang a little bell for her speech yeah exactly so you never actually hear her speak i also really enjoy the parts of the of the movie when he's chasing his shadow Oh, yeah. And so that's really great with animation, but also in the stage play, it's so fun because his shadow, you know, you see his shadow, but when he's actually catching his shadow, they use like nylons. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so you you see them actually sewing it onto him. That's adorable. I know. When theaters open up back at... Right? When theaters open up again, I hope that somebody does Peter Pan I hope that comes back. That's really great. Well, I think a direct adaptation that comes from this is another Disney one, and it's my favorite adaptation. <laughs> I think a lot of kids are, who are, I think a lot of kids from the 80s and 90s will remember is Hook. Mm-hmm. This came out I'm in- I'm a 90s kid. I remember that. I'm an 80s kid. I remember it. <laughs> uh, it came out in 1991. One. <laughs> it came out in 1991, and it stars Dustin Hoffman as Hook and Robin Williams as Peter Pan. And also, Julia Roberts as Tinkerbell. And Maggie Smith as old Wendy. And Gwyneth Paltrow as young Wendy. Yes, yeah. and... Which we know Roxanne loves Gwyneth oh Paltrow. Oh my god, I have a whole thing about... <laughs> I have notes on notes on notes about this. But there's a fun cameo that most people might not catch. I didn't so, catch it. There's a part in the movie where um, you first they first get to sort of the amazing pirates lair, mm-hmm. their fort, yeah. and they're going to put somebody in the boo box. Oh, who is that? Okay, so the premise is uh, Hook is asking all his men, who thought that, who's not confident that I can catch Peter Pan? And then one, one pirate's one like, me. <laughs> and then they're like, get the boo box, which basically is a barrel with like scorpions inside of it. Yep. And it's terrifying if you're a child. It's terrifying as an adult. So do you know who that person is? No, who? It's Glenn Close. No, it's not. It is. It is Glenn Close. Those piercing blue <laughs> eyes. Yeah, she That's really so wanted funny. to be in it, and she had a great time. Yeah, so I Glenn never Close. I guess because she's dressed so. Yeah, she's in male drag. Yeah, so well. Mm-hmm. So she has a fake beard. She has a hit. And when I was first watching, I'm like, that pirate has beautiful skin. <laughs> And then I, I was looking up, you know, fun facts about the movie, and Glenn Close is the, the boo box pirate. That's so And you can amazing. tell that she's having a ball. Yeah. Well, let's give a little bit of a synopsis about Hook. Yeah. I love this movie. Even though it's Steven Spielberg's, the director's mm-hmm. least favorite movie. Oh, he's very, very upset about it. I know. Years later. Still can't get over it. Well, I'll give a quick synopsis. So the premise is that Peter Pan has grown up. And actually, the idea for this movie came from one of the producer's children. Mm-hmm. And he was a little kid, maybe five or six. And he said, well, what if Peter Pan grew up? And they ran with it. Yeah. And I think it works really well. So the idea is that Peter Pan was adopted into an orphanage. 
run by Wendy. Right, because Wendy has now grown up as well. She leaves Neverland, even in the original story. And grows up. And grows up. And she starts an orphanage, and she adopted some of the lost boys, and she adopted Including Peter. Toodles. Toodles, who keeps losing his literal marbles. Yeah. It's very cute. Very sweet. And so Peter Pan grew up, and he was adopted by an American family. One thing that bothers mm-hmm. me, though, he's adopted when he's, like, 13, and yet he doesn't have a British accent anymore. So I think it's because he lived in Neverland for, who knows, hundreds of years, maybe, and then decides to leave because he sees Wendy's granddaughter, Moira, and kind of falls in love with her and decides not to go back to Neverland, and then is, like, immediately adopted into an American family. So who knows where he lost his accent in those... They don't speak the Queen's English. Yeah, and... they don't speak the Queen's English. But well, I think the, it's fine. the pirates seem to. They do. But I'm going to go with it because... I think Robin Williams didn't want to do an accent. Uh, probably. Which is <laughs> ironic because that guy loves to do weird stuff. I know. Well, Robin Williams plays Peter Banning. So that's mm-hmm. who Peter Pan grows up into. Peter Banning. And he is a very serious 90s dad who's always on his giant cell phone. <laughs> And he has two children, Jack, who plays baseball, because in the 90s, you have to play baseball, baseball. and your dad on his big phone has to miss your games. Yep. And then there's a very cute little girl named Maggie, Mm -hmm. who's just kind of there to be cute cute and say little pipsqueak sort of things. She sings a cute little song later on. Yeah. She's, she's very sweet. Uh, and the, the premise is that, you know, he's a workaholic and they are going back to the orphanage to celebrate old Wendy uh, getting a wing of a children's hospital named after her. And I think it's based loosely on that Ormond Street Hospital that J.M. Barry donated all oh, of his, yeah, all okay. of the rights to. It They don't really say it, but I think it's supposed to be an homage. Sure, that makes sense. Well, when they get there, they're going out to this fancy banquet for the opening of the hospital wing. And it's very funny because Maggie Smith is only 56 when this movie is made. Oh yeah, isn't that crazy? So they put age up makeup on her and she looks exactly as she does now. She does. She's McGonagall in that movie. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly McGonagall. Yeah, she looks exactly. I forgot she was McGonagall. I always think of her as um, Violet from Downton Abbey. Okay. She also looks basically just like Violet from Downton Abbey. Yeah, uh, so whoever did the, the age up makeup did an amazing job. <laughs> they did it's that, a bit like, uncanny. progression software on her. And they were yeah. Like, this is exactly But it is a bit look. uncanny because like around her eyes she looks yeah, young Yeah, she still. looks young still. It's very weird. For sure. Yeah, it's weird that she's so young. And like they didn't plays. like age her neck enough. True. But I mean, Maggie Smith, wherever you are, Dame Maggie, Maggie Smith, Maggie. you are a national treasure to England. International treasure. International treasure. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I honestly don't care that her makeup looks a little off because as a seven-year-old watching this movie, I was like, oh, Wendy. Oh, Wendy. Yeah, it's very, she's great. Well, while they're at this banquet, Hook, back in Neverland, gets word that Peter Pan has returned to England, which is weird. Like, why can't he go to America to Uh, mess with Pan? Because there's no direct line from America to Neverland. Oh, silly me. Then it's like the 14th star on the northeast (laughs) corner. (laughs) Well, he hears he's back in London and Peter, and Hook kidnaps Jack and Maggie Mm -hmm. from the very room where Peter Pan once took Wendy to Neverland. And then he really decides to mess with Peter Pan by trying to get his kids to love him. So Hook tries to get his (laughs) his children to love him. Some great psychology going on. Yeah. So Peter Bannon, who is now Banning, who is now a, a big dork. Goes to Neverland and, you know, at first he tries to be an adult about it. And he's like, give me my children back. He's like, sure, go ahead. He has them like in a cartoonish <laughs> net. Yep. And he says, go Hoist ahead and it up. fly up there and get your children. And of course he can't. Because he doesn't believe enough. Which, of course, just devastates Jack. And so you can see the little wheels turning that Jack is going to become a pirate. Yep. Because he wants <laughs> Hook to be his father figure. Yeah. So basically, then we have a training montage where Robin <laughs> uh, Robin Williams has to become Pan again. So now we have Julie Roberts as Tinkerbell. Reining him up. And he goes back and sees a lot of the Lost Boys, too, who do not believe that he's Pan at first. Mm-hmm. There's this really charming scene. This guy, this like new guy, Rufio, is like taking over the Lost Boys. And Rufio, yeah, Rufio's the Rufio. leader. Oh. Rufio uh, mm-hmm. is also the name of a band. Oh, I didn't know that. Which is... I know I'm only four years older than you, but okay, in my day, there was a, I think it was an emo band named Rufio that was pretty popular. Or it was more, no, it's not, maybe it was more ska. It was very like Panic <laughs> of, of the Disco. Of course it was ska. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that 
mid two thousands were uh, a stupid time to be in high school. They were a weird, weird time. And the reason that Rufio got cast is because he was the only kid that Steven Spielberg was afraid of. Hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. I believe that. So basically, Rufio is sort of like the big bully. Yeah, he literally draws a line in the sand and is like, anyone who believes he's Peter Pan. Go over there, waste your lives. Anyone who's with me, the real guy, come on this side. And all of the kids run over to his side. And one charming little boy, like, oh "Oh my god, walks over to Peter and, like, touches his face and takes off his glasses and, like, looks really intently into his eyes. And then he's like, there you are, Peter. No! (laughs) There are a lot of cry moments or... or Well, for some of us. Some of us are robots. There's a lot of clumping moments in this movie where I'm like, oh... If I would cry during movies, I would right now. Yeah. That I, seems sad. I do cry at that point. It, it's <laughs> so sad. good. Mm-hmm. So he goes to his training montage. He's helped by Tinkerbell, played by Julie Roberts, who, by the way, got the unfortunate uh, moniker of a difficult woman when she was working on this movie. Oh, because of this one? She was going through a really bad breakup with Kiefer Sutherland. Hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. 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 So she basically was going through a horrible breakup, and... Was not on her A game, and and um, yeah, she was labeled difficult. And Steven Spielberg was like, "I'm never working with her again." And did he? I don't think so. I don't think so. But I think she's also pretty charming in this movie. She gets this scene where because she's small and flat, you know, fairy like for most of the movie, mm-hmm. and then she has this scene later on when Peter comes to her where she all of a sudden like grows to real size. And why does she? Why does that happen? Is it under- because her emotions are too big to be held in her tiny body? Oh, and it's so sweet. That's sweet. And then I'm she literally gets like clutching a very my heart right now, like a little, like ball gown dress. It's like the Cinderella yeah. dress. Yeah, it looks basically very Cinderella. And she's like, "I've always loved you, and I'll always love you." And this emotion is just mm-hmm. too big. It's very sweet. And they almost kiss, but then he starts to. Re- so for a while, he loses himself in being Peter Pan. He mm-hmm. almost even forgets that he has children. He forgets that he has a wife back home that he loves. And so when they're about to kiss, he's like, oh, no, Moira, my wife. Right. And then he remembers his kids. And he's like, oh, right, I'm here to Mm -hmm. get my children back. And that goes back a little bit to the book and the play. Peter Pan is, like, stuck in this state of adolescence where he basically doesn't remember things from, like, one minute to the next. So, like, he'll have a pirate fight one day and then come back the next day and they'll be like, oh, Peter, how was your pirate fight? And he'll be like, I didn't do that. (laughs) <laughs> like he just he just like is so like not aware of time and not aware of like he's like Dory from Finding Nemo yeah and doesn't really like understand cause and effect and like how his actions like affect other people so he's, basically a teenager yeah he's basically just a pre-adult adolescent his frontal cortex yeah, has not exactly. developed yet but that's kind of a great like throwback uh to that like regression in that movie where he kind of forgets that he has responsibilities and a life and regresses to that adolescent state this it, is, that might be reading a little too much into it because this is kind of like a fun movie, but I'm going to go with it. I love it. It also makes me think of an article I read just yesterday that during the pandemic, adults uh, have been regressing to mm-hmm. listening to music from their high school years as a way of like self-soothing. Oh, I definitely have not <clears throat> done that. Uh, yeah, I absolutely have. I remember when... <laughs> I 100% have done yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm just going to be earnest about it. <laughs> Me too. I absolutely... I remember texting a friend saying, you know how I know I'm in my 30s where it's Saturday night and I just spent two hours cleaning my kitchen, organizing my spice cabinet, and listening to all the hits of 2003... This movie, because eventually, right, like, we know it's all going to end up okay. He saves his kids, he goes back, and they have a better life, hopefully later on. But sadly, it's like a big part of my childhood. I watch this a lot with my brothers. Oh, absolutely. This has become a cult classic. Yeah. I still sometimes will say bangerang when something cool happens. Bangerang! <laughs> I have to say, when I was watching the movie, and bangerang is what they shout, is I was shouting bangerang oh, yeah. with them. It's great. But for a movie that's, like, so iconic to you and I, it it was nominated for five Academy Awards, and this totally boggles my mind. Nominated for five Academy Awards and lost all of them. Really? All of them. No. And you know what it lost to? Bugsy, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, and Beauty and the Beast. Which Beauty and the Beast I get. That's fine. Beauty and the Beast can stay. But Terminator 2? Fine. Have you seen Bugsy? I haven't seen Bugsy. It's 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 a biopic of the gangster who started Las Vegas. Okay. It's fine. And I'd say the same about Terminator 2. Why was Terminator 2 Judgment Day nominated for multiple Academy Awards? It wasn't Terminator Academy 2 Awards? Electric Boogaloo? No. 
<laughs> but I literally, I will never in my life understand that, ever. Mm. Doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, just a couple more facts about Hook. David Bowie was offered the part of Captain Hook, but turned it down. <gasps> that makes me so sad. Can you imagine? That would have been so good. Like, Labyrinth, Dustin David Hoffman, Bowie. Don't get me wrong. Dustin Hoffman is really good. Oh, he's it. great. He's, he's great. Fabulous. Very scary. Yeah. And Bob Haskins plays me. Mm-hmm. And I, I love me some Bob Haskins. Yeah. He's great. It, uh, uh, yeah. I have a crush on him. Okay. Weird. That's okay. Uh, all your celebrity crushes are weird. So, David Bowie. David Bowie, uh, yeah, was offered the part of Captain Hook. Dustin Hoffman, uh, when they are flying to England from America, this is so fun, he is the voice of the pilot. And so he gets on and he mm. says, this is your captain speaking. It totally is him. Isn't that fun? Mm-hmm. I love stuff like that. And then just another thing, Michael Jackson ooh, wanted to play Peter Pan. Ugh. And then they, they actually told him what the, the movie was about. And they're like, we don't think this is your jam. And he was like, that's correct. Mm. Uh, I, yeah. don't, I don't love that. <laughs> that's not a great look, Michael. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Carrie Fisher, who of course played Princess Leia, was a writer on the screenplay. But she's uncredited. For shame, Hollywood. For shame. Can we talk about a couple other, a couple other adaptations? Sure. Super duper quick. Yeah. Just some things that you should take a look at if you're out and about and curious about more Peter Pan. You could check it out from the Community Library Network. You probably could. One is a 1987 teen horror flick called The Lost Boys. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, take a look at that. It's a pretty, from what I understand, typical teen horror film. That okay. Lo- looks like it's right up my alley. I think it's fun. There's a Dungeons and Dragons campaign setting called Neverland, the Impossible Island. Okay. If you're a tabletop RPGer, check that out. There's also, I mean, there's tons of adaptations. Some of my, <clears throat> and I haven't read this, but I'm really excited to now that I know it's a thing. Alan Moore, who's a famous graphic novelist. Alan Moore and Melinda Gebby wrote a graphic novel called Lost Girls that has Ooh. Wendy and Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz uh-huh. and Alice from Alice in Wonderland oh. that I'm super excited to check out. Oh, cool. Yeah. But it's apparently a little bit adult, so just know that going Heads up. It. Heads up. Got it. Yeah. But that's the ones I wanted to mention. There's also, in case you're traveling internationally, sculptures in at least four continents of Peter Pan, oh, which I thought was kind of cool. So lovely. Scotland, New Zealand, London, Brussels, New York, Melbourne, Glasgow, Western Cape of South Africa. Those are just a few of the ones I found. Cool. He's everywhere. Uh, one of the most recent adaptations, which sort of got the, <laughs> the raspberry <laughs> from the critics, was uh, made for TV, and it was Peter Pan Live, when that was a popular thing to do, oh, yeah. with Allison Williams as Peter Pan and Christopher Walken as Hook, who I've seen him in other musicals, but uh, he can't sing. Doesn't surprise me. But he's very charming in, um, he's very charming in Hairspray. Uh, but somehow his hook was a little awkward. Mm. I think charming is our buzzword of the day. I think we've said that more about this movie slash book. It is. That it is really charming. It gives me warm fuzzies. And here's the thing about reading kids books as an adult. A, it's a really great nostalgia trip. Whether you've read the book before or not. I read it for the first time last week and still had that nostalgic feeling because I've seen the movies and that sort of thing. B, I think that sharing those sorts of books with your family and your friends and your kids is also creates like a really special bond. And C, you catch a lot of things that you didn't catch when you were a kid when you read, you know, kids books as an adult. For instance, who knew that Peter Pan was murdering lots of boys? Not me. Not me. News to me. We have a lot of unexpected murder on this podcast. So much unexpected murder. Murders in everything, apparently. On that happy, happy note... <laughs> you ready to wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. This has been the podcast. The book isn't necessarily better. Again, we are your podcast hostesses with the mostesses. Roxanne and Michaela. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. You have an entire spice cabinet? Yeah, I like to cook. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday when I grow up, I'll have a whole cabinet for spices. Yeah. Doesn't everyone? No. And moved to England in 1937. That can't possibly be right. I have I have one of those little like spice racks. No, I have like Lazy Susans, and that has all like all the cooking sauces. And then I have like a multi-layered cabinet thing, so they're all sort of like in a stadium stand, so that mm. you can see them all. And then you can organize them by. His name was Alan Knee. Yep. Like the knights who say knee. Uh, well, like your knee. There we go. I got I got that out. Yes. Thank you. Oh.
we're like, I bet you don't even know the difference between Spanish paprika or Hungarian.